as a quick note, today's will be seven minutes for presentation, two for questions this time. So there's a little bit less leeway. Um, but yeah. We should get right into it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Hold on. <laughs> now it should work. Okay, there we go. Okay, hello, I'm Elijah, as you already know, hopefully, um, and today I'll be presenting on a project looking at the uses of gender data on GitHub. So just to go over the problem, we kind of talked about this when I proposed, but um, gender is defined as someone's inherent sense of being male, female, or something else by the American Psychological Association. It's a good, simple working definition. Um, gender is used across society, but of course also in software. Um, the way gender is used by code and how um, it's handled can affect all people, but especially marginalized communities like transgender people or non-binary people. Uh, there's a little prior work exploring gender and software. So I wanted to look at this using GitHub data. And specifically, I was curious about how gender data is typically encoded in open source, um, what gender is used for in open source data, and then also how developers make their decisions about gender data. So the approach was to mine from GitHub data. Um, oh, that was the back button. There we go. Um, so because I hypothesized, uh, Bogdan also hypothesized that the majority of code on GitHub would be completely unrelated, um, I focused on a list of 34 topics ranging from very broad like website or database to some very specific topics like gender recognition or gender classification. Um, from those, I, I retrieved all the repos that had, that were in those topics, had more than 10 stars, had a license, had a programming language set as their language, um, and were pushed to after October 31st, 2021, which was a year before I started data collection. And those were sort of minimal activity and also popularity requirements. Um, and so those made up my sampling frame of about 19,000 projects. And then I selected up to 300. Uh, some texts didn't have 300 projects, but up to 300 pro uh, repos, excuse me, from each. And that made a sample of about 5,500 5, projects. Um, and for each of those, I, uh, I checked whether the repo contained the word gender in either its code, and that excluded files that had text extensions like .txt, .pdf, et cetera. And then I also looked if there was the word gender in any issues, and then I did manual analysis of a 20% sample to see uh, how accurate that was for finding examples of gender-based code. Oh, that went back. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't very accurate. 15% um, of the repos in the sample had the word gender in it, uh, but only about two thirds of, and I'm reporting sort of approximate fractions here because there's pretty wide error bars, so you don't need to know the specific uh, number, but um, about two thirds of the sample were not, uh, were using gender, but the remainder third were sort of um, other things like, um, the unique uh, one common false positive was Unicode characters. Some of them have the word gender in them, like transgender symbol or um, other things like that. Uh, and then natural language processing was another false positive uh, that was common. Um, but in that sample of the projects that were actually using gender data, about half used a binary conception of gender. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't actually use like a Boolean variable. It was more often to use like a custom object to encode gender or a string or a character or an int. Although I think with the int, it probably is just a zero and one that they're doing. But um, yeah, the most common use case was for a profile page, like on a social media application. Some projects, a considerable amount, like a fifth of the sample were just interfaces for other things. So like downloading data from Facebook or something like that. Um, so the remainder of my, oh, <laughs> the last, Oh, I have a, I forgot. I broke this into another slide. Sorry. About a third of the manually inspected projects that actually used de gender data um, had the word gender in one of their issues. Um, for the most part, those examples are things where it's like gender's not displaying properly on the page or other technical bugs that aren't really about how gender is encoded. Um, I did find three examples so far. I'm not done with the analysis of the topics. Um, the, uh, I did find about three posts so far where it was about adding gender or adding 
a third gender option to the project, but there was no discussion on those posts. So it's not really very useful. Um, maybe I'll find more. Uh, my goal from here is to take the false positive, like what I learned from the false positives, and then try to like automatically uh, cut down the rest of the sample into just examples of using gender code. Um, some two, how much longer do I have? Two minutes. two minutes. Okay, that's perfect. So two sort of just really quick qualitative insights I saw. Um, one that was interesting is conflation of gender with sex was evident in some code. So you'd have like, this first example is a facial recognition application where the variable in their model is called sex, but then they display it as gender, which I think is kind of weird. Um, and then you have another example, and I saw this actually multiple times, taking the Apple biological sex variable, which uh, is from the health kit, um, and then setting it equal to something called gender. So um, that, that sort of a, represents the social conflation of biological sex with gender. Um, and then another thing was a lot of play, uh, a lot of services like to have some sort of profile picture customized based on somebody's gender. Um, and sort of an interesting practice is like male being the default and then just having else is female. Um, so everything else is female. Um, and then this other one is another example. The first top one's from a social media website website. The second one's from a chat application. And so that's it for what I have to present. What's next? So I want to try some heuristics to see like if I can easily automatically classify the rest of the sample, like see how well they perform on the manually inspect the sample and then try to cut down the rest of the sample. Originally, I was planning to do like um, linguistic analysis across like the entire data set. But once I realized the like estimated accuracy was really bad in terms of like actually being code that uses gender data, I realized I needed to do another step before I do any more processing on the rest of the data. Do you have any recommendations for to um, I think for most applications, well, one thing that's interesting to me is like for most of these applications, it would be pretty easy for them to add another gender option, even though like most of it, because they're using like an object or a stringed coding where you could very easily just have like allow somebody either to enter a custom thing or allow somebody to say like other or something like that. Um, in most cases, they're it doesn't seem like they're using some sort of, it should be easy is what I'm saying to switch. Um, but in terms of recommendations, I mean, the recommendations are kind of already out there, which is to either say male, female, or specify um, to allow people to enter their custom gender if they wanted to. Um, I think like in terms of new recommendations, I'm not sure the main thing would be to like perhaps have libraries that sort of uh, handle this so people don't have to come up with it on their own every time. Um, would people actually use those? I don't know. Uh, but yeah. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I'm great on time. So we'll move on to the next person. You may have the speaker and the speaker. Ask the can somebody pick you up. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, yeah, I'm going to present our project, uh, understanding the behavior of program repair bolts by mining the GitHub repository. So this work is done by me and Manisha. So originally we were thinking, uh, we, we know that program repair research has been active for a couple of years and there are fruitful results. And we want to understand how this technique uh, is being applied to industry and how this technique is being adopted. How can we uh, improve the technique to help the industry to uh, adopt, the, uh, adopt it better? So uh, initially we were, trying to answer four research questions. 
starting from what type of bugs can be fixed by existing program repair bolts and what type of bugs are actually fixed by program repair bolts. And we also uh, want to understand are all patches from program repair bolts uh, accepted by developers? If yes, what, uh, what information is used for? If no, uh, how can we improve the accept rate? However, uh, we actually forgot to ask <laughs> research question zero. Are there any program repair bolts used by real open source project? So I'm going to uh, navigate uh, through the slides to tell you how Research Zero is also. And uh, initially, we were thinking about uh, this uh, mix of quantitative analysis by mining the word of code this set and also combined with the qualitative analysis by interviewing the pro project maintainers. And here's the process. Uh, we have registered and accessed the WSC uh, data, and we uh, have the can be mapping from the WSC data uh, of the votes. And we use this existing algorithm called BMine to ident uh, identify votes. However, it takes uh, more than weeks to finish. The, so we didn't uh, rerun the algorithm. We used the results from the BMI directly. So uh, currently, BMI only contains one program repair bolt. So we will focus on it. Uh, that bolt contains uh, over 40,000 40, commits uh, across 80 projects. As uh, we also analyze and classify commits from that uh, program repair bolt. So uh, we had several challenges while we analyzed the data. The first challenge is that uh, after a manual uh, sampling, a uh, manual analysis of a sampled commit, we noticed that there are non bolt commits from the, the bolt of cut. So uh, for example, uh, there are three commit messages from the bolt of Count. The first one is merge this commit to another one. Uh, clearly, this is from a human. And the second one is bug commit from this project uh, inject to this uh, project uh, from this commit injected to this project. This is clearly also from a human. And the third commit called automated repair information, blah, blah, blah. This is actually from the phone. So uh, number of commits affects result because we want to understand what type of bugs are actually fixed by the bolt itself. So we actually need to remove them. Uh, but existing classification techniques requires labeling and training. So uh, we actually didn't use them. Uh, we actually uh, we invent our own classification algorithm by identifying the common code patterns in the commit messages, for example, uh, and we can refine this uh, pattern uh, or template iteratively. For example, when we have two commit messages, we can see this, this commit fixes this out of memory issue. And the second commit, commit messages says that this commit fix a crash. And then we can create a template, say this commit fixes a wild card. And we refine this template iteratively. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, after the refinement, we have we identified there are thirty thousand commits are from are actually from bots, uh, and fifteen are from Pyongyang. So the second problem we noticed is that there are commits that are sent to the experimental projects to test the functionality of the bolt. So for example, there are commits sent to the test repair data or PDF bolts with this issue number. Those are actually experimental projects. They are not real projects. And we also find a real project called this uh, Eclipse Halbit. Those are the real projects used by open source community. So we also filter them out. And our results uh, shows that there are four projects are real open source projects and 83 projects are experimental projects. So, and this is the final result. After all the filtering, there are only six commits 
are interesting. Uh, by interesting, we mean they are from boats and they are trying to fix bugs and they are contributing, they are submitted to real open source project. But zero commit is adopted by the upstream, mean, meaning that those commits are sent to the upstream and they are rejected. And if you look at the, the, the commit, the, the GitHub says that this commit does not belong to any branch on this repository and may belong to a fork outside of the repository. So overview of the next steps uh, for timing, uh, we, we didn't actually find a uh, real program repurple uh, both currently, uh, and we are trying to document the process and then uh, demonstrate the, our filtering technique. But we, we can still try to answer RQ3 and RQ4 uh, because we, we saw those commits are sent to the open source community. We can still uh, try to understand why those uh, commits are rejected uh, or not adopted by the upstream. So, yeah, thanks. Why did you think some of the commits were not done by Zanis, even though they came from the bottom down? Oh, uh, because first, uh, if it's a merge, uh, the boss explicitly says it doesn't do merge, uh -huh. merging stuff. The second thing is that there are commits that says, I inject this bug to the this repository. So basically, uh, it's clearly done by a human to test the, to test the functionality of the bug. Interesting. So yeah. And this is the most popular repair tool. Yes, yes. This uh, they actually have a paper. This uh, boat called Repairinator, and they actually have a from Eclipse, and they have a paper about this this boat. So also outside of this data set, you think in general this happens to be the most popular tool right now? Yes, yes. This boat is mentioned by multiple like uh, oh. GitHub boat analysis uh, works. So yeah. So actually, this is the only primary variables uh, I, I knew we found from the GitHub. So maybe find a different research field. <laughs> Do you know why the commits were rejected? Uh, uh, that's something we are actually trying to do. So uh, yes, yes, that's something we are trying to answer. Uh, Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, so um, so my project is about uh, automatically fixing breaking changes in data science libraries. And just to recap, so the motivation, the reason I was doing this is that data science uh, libraries tend to be updated far more frequently than uh, traditional counterparts. And whenever a developer updates their library, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, the API of the library might change. So um, this is this is where the breaking changes come from, and that can cause uh, library clients or downstream tasks to to fail. And so, and the reason I'm studying uh, breaking changes in this specific context of data science libraries is that. Uh, uh, data science libraries have a huge impact on the software ecosystem. So this is data that I found on a recent study and around 50% of the new projects submitted to GitHub, this is in 2018, uh, have at least one data science slash uh, machine learning dependency. And so my reasoning was uh, what I wanted to do was to build a tool to uh, somehow to partially automate this, this problem of breaking changes specifically for data science libraries because they have such a large uh, wide, widespread usage. And so my methodology was I, uh, to study the breaking changes, I collected issues, GitHub issues from five uh, well-known data science libraries. I did not pick this, uh, these, this five. This, I think they encompass around 90% of the dependencies of Python projects, data science Python projects. Um, and these issues were all labeled for deprecation. And what I wanted to do was first, I wanted to um, qualitatively uh, inspect uh, the issues to understand what was changing in the, the scope of the, the library and how 
developers conveying to clients these, these changes. And then the second part was uh, quantitative. I want to I wanted to know the frequency prevalence, how many breaking changes are actually being introduced per library per version. Were clients actually being affected by those changes? And then using the taxonomy that I built from the first part of the study, um, quantify and uh, label a set of the, the pull request and issues that I, that I was studying. And so to show you, uh, to tell you about the data, so the five libraries that I was telling you about earlier were these, uh, Pandas, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, and NumPy. And these were the, the, the number of issues I was looking at. And so what I did, I started with Pandas, and I, Pandas had 347 issues labeled for deprecation uh, in the release notes. And so I looked at the 347 uh, issues, and uh, out of those, um, out of those 174 maps to pull requests were actually introducing the breaking changes or deprecations. Uh, so I manually looked into those and the, the types of changes that I found were not significantly different from what we know from traditional uh, libraries. There, there's a lot of uh, uh, renames, methods being renamed. So the API changes because the method is renamed. Arguments are renamed. Sometimes positional arguments are turned into non-positional and, and uh, the opposite to namespace. Sometimes functionality is removed, so they just remove a method. Sometimes they turn methods into arguments and the other way around. And there are also other behavioral changes. So this part was not turned out not to be too interesting. But the second part, which is what I, I really wanted to focus more on, was uh, on how developers were conveying these changes to, to clients. And so in, in the pull request, I found four different, way, four different ways of uh, conveying information. So what developers were doing, um, the first thing they do usually, this is, this is almost in all of them, is that textual description of uh, what is changing. So they can say, to, for instance, API X is deprecated, please use Y in future versions. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they have um, examples. Uh, reflecting how to achieve the same behavior, but with the new set of APIs. And then, then they also have um, internal changes, so changes to the library code. So if you go look at the pull request and the, how the code change, you can see how the library code is changing to reflect the, the, the breaking change. And, um, and, and you can also see that in test cases. And in some cases, they just don't, don't say anything. They just say, they just remove the feature and there is nothing, nothing else. And so my original hypothesis was that I could use these, the third kind the internal changes to build the tool to automatically uh, derive rules to fix breaking changes in client code. So what I had in mind, the use case that I had in mind was something like this. So for this case, for instance, let's say there is this API called fail and less equal that is deprecated in favor of a third equal. So now I want to mine a rule like this one on top to update downstream clients of this library. Um, whenever they update their dependency. And so um, when I was looking at the internal changes of the, the, the library code, I, I saw um, for one line changes, three patterns. So this is the first one. It's not too clear from here, but this, this one, they're just doing a renaming. So this is one of the things I was telling you earlier. They're just renaming the, um, the arguments and the set of uh, inputs it takes. There's also more complex uh, refactoring tasks um, when there's this thing, it's, I can't zoom in, but this, what they're doing is they're breaking down this method index into multiple methods. And the way to figure out which method you should use from now on depends on the type that you were given uh, has, uh, the, the, the type of the object you were given as input to the, to the original method. So in the first case, there's index is as mapped date index because you're giving it as input and a date and on the bottom one you're giving it tuples so the new method is from tuples and then the third one uh, is even more complex so in this case what they're doing is the api is changing for some cases so you need you can keep the the, the original api call um you can keep the original API call in some cases, but sometimes you have to change it depending on the, the, the type of, the, the, depending on the object itself you're giving it uh, uh, has argument. And so uh, uh, what I, so um, as a follow-up, so I looked after the, the um, I looked again at the 174 pull requests and I found that 24-ish percent of them uh, 
uh, were uh, at enough information from test cases to mine these uh, rules. And I'm doing that for a scikit-learn now too, and it's like around 14%. I wanna do it for others. I also built a tool, but I don't know to which extent yet these, these rules that I can mine, potentially mine are actually gonna be useful to clients. Uh, so I don't have a lot of clarity here. This is what I have, sorry. Could you test the rules you come up with by looking at the first two libraries on the other two? Uh, yeah, so what I'm doing is I, so I'm mining a rule and then I apply a rule to the same code and see if I get the same thing. Right, so could you test that the rule generalized to different libraries? Could you I don't, so the rule will end up, will, the rule will be specific to the API that's, that's changing it. You mean like downstream? No, so like you've learned this rule from uh, pandas, mm -hmm. and you apply it to NumPy. I don't, uh, no, I don't think so, because the rule will be specific to a pandas object. I see. So it can only be applied for pandas. Um, What's the process of creating these rules like? Like, do, would you need to make a new tool for every time that a new type of breaking change is released? No, so the, the, the idea is the, the, the tool that I have takes as input the, the code before and the code after and infers the elements that need to be changed. And then um, it's, it's slightly complex uh, to explain without the example, but it comes up with this rule automatically, uh, independently of the, the library you're dealing with. Um, it fails sometimes, but works on others. So you'll build a bot, but then nobody will use it? Yeah, this, I, I don't know, maybe. Well, I'd use the paper. That's true. But so what I was thinking, um, what I was thinking was, uh, so there's like, there's this like long hanging, long, long hanging fruit that you can, these, these rules, this kind of changes are, uh, things are easy to mine are correct. So maybe people will use them yeah. at some point, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just aiming for the, the simplest things first. Yeah. Because I don't want to be built up something too complex that nobody will use. Yeah. If it makes sense, what you propose. Hopefully it will at least. Great, yeah, I think that will be helpful. Well, thanks, very good. Yes, so uh, we're presenting on software testing using large language models. Uh, so I'll go into the problem statement, which is uh, similar to before. So testing is a very important part of software development. So like as you write code, you also have to correspondingly write like a set of unit tests to test that code. Uh, however, like testing in the space of language modeling has received a lot less attention than things such as code generation and bug repair, like defect prediction, for example. Uh, so our idea is that we can improve state of the art and software testing uh, through using large language models. And the idea is we want to basically model the distribution of uh, tested functionality given uh, like the code itself. And we also want to tie this with like coverage based analysis. We want to ensure that the tests that we generate run and that they actually are like useful to developers in the end. Um, so in order to do this, we first need to mine data from GitHub and then we built this really large language model and we built another tool on top of that that actually performs the downstream tasks. But for the sake of uh, this, project right now, we could only focus on uh, analyzing the data mind to guide the modeling decision because we don't have the model ready yet. It's training right now and will hopefully be done training in a month. <laughs> we'll see. And because we don't have the model, we don't have the tool, so we could not evaluate it. And we also performed a qualitative analysis to just better understand uh, the testing needs and also the current state of whether people test their code or not. So as I said, we mined lots of data. We looked 
at approximately 20,000 projects for Java and Python and ended up with 23 million files, which we filtered using different things that have been talked about in literature. And we also apply deduplication to not make the same mistakes. And we end up with 15 million files. And we did a lot of analysis to basically understand uh, how projects are currently tested because each of these decisions is sort of guides our modeling decisions. So for example, we this is these are plots on um, the distribution of file counts based on stars. So you can see that the projects that have more stars tend to have more files and tend to be tested more. And we uh, also were able to collect more test and code file pairs from, from them. But uh, projects with fewer stars tend to have tend to not be tested very well. Uh, this is just a distribution of projects based on star count. So you might say that if you don't have enough testing and code pairs, then maybe you should just mine more. But there are more projects which have fewer stars than uh, have projects which have like greater stars. And we found out already that projects with fewer stars don't tend to be very well tested. And so we did not find enough uh, file pairs. I mean, that's not true. We have around 400,000 file pairs in total. But in general, the trend we saw is that uh, most of the projects tend to have fewer number of file pairs compared to since they don't have as many stars. Um, yeah, so then the second part of our contribution was the survey. And the idea of the survey was to understand the testing needs of developers. Uh, so we broke it down into really three different categories. Uh, the first set of questions were demographic to understand who our audience was uh, that we were surveying. Uh, the second part was on testing practices. So like specifically, what kinds of practices do developers use in their workflow? Like how frequently do they even test? And then the final part of our survey was more focused around like what kind of features do developers want to see in a testing tool for it to be useful and for them to like actually use it as a part of their workflow. Uh, so I'll just go into some like high level conclusions. An uh, important caveat here is that this is only a pilot study. So this was only done with like mostly people in TCS. So the results that we have might not be representative of the general population. Uh, what we found is that people who are researchers tend to write a lot of code, but they don't tend to test their code very much. We found that like 58% of people write code like very, very frequently, but they test their code less than 25% of the time. Uh, and I did some coding on the main gating factors behind this. So what we found is that uh, testing is time consuming. There's a high maintenance overhead to testing. And like these are some of the reasons why like researchers don't test more overall. Uh, and what we also found is like uh, in terms of features that researchers want in an automated testing tool, uh, the two most important things to them are that they're human readable and that they're able to find interesting edge cases. And what's interesting is a lot of the testing literature focuses on things such as like code coverage and mutation testing, which are things that our survey population didn't find as useful as things such as readable tests and high quality generated tests. So that was an uh, interesting finding there too. And yeah, that's all that we have for our slides. The downstream task for the language model. Where um, do you want to take this question? Yeah, so I guess like so the output of the language model like might not be correct. So we need to do things such as like ensuring that like it conforms with the oracle of like what we're testing itself, which is like a hard problem, and also like fixing the language model and like being able to get coverage from like the generated tests. Like all of those are like things that you would have to do like after the initial pre-training stuff. So it's given like a file and the output is a test? Yeah, okay. it's like given like a code file, no, we want to output this, like... There are two things. So one is the language model. So the input to the language model is a code file and you could also give it a test file and we want it to be able to generate more tests. Okay. But the downstream task could make use of the tests that were generated by the pre-trained model and fine tune it on whatever you want to do. So it could be finding bugs in the test or 
it could be something more specific. Okay. What when you do the service, do you define what is testing? Like, do you consider I give my program some input and look at the output as testing, or do you consider proper unit testing, regression testing, or yeah, so we have like a list of things that we said were like various testing practices, and we also give an option to like specify additional testing practices. Uh, an interesting thing is one person said that like their testing practices are like manual testing. They would just like try like random inputs and outputs and like they would get results that way. It's like we did have someone like that too. Could you show that diagram? We have the star counts and testing. Could it be that just the um, projects with more stars are bigger and they also have more tests because they're bigger? It is possible, yes. But um, so we use very simple heuristics to get the test and code pairs. So even if they're bigger, if they're naming conventions are weird, then we can't extract a pair from it. But what I'm saying is maybe the correlation has nothing to do with stars, maybe it's just the size. So they're better tested, seemingly. Not because they're more popular in any way, just because they're bigger. It is possible. We actually have like a few other plots in the report where we do distribution of projects based on number of files. And in smaller projects, they tend to have, I mean, it, it is possible that the proportion is true, but at the same time, we did see that the, there were several projects which didn't have as many stars, which didn't have any testing. But we also found a few projects where they did have a lot of stars, but they had zero test files. That's because a lot of those projects were like tutorials for uh, machine learning and like data science and stuff. So those repositories tend to be very popular, but they don't have any testing in them. So we talked about something called multivariate regression in class at some point. Yeah. That might be something to use here to actually be more confident that what you're seeing has anything to do with stars. True. Yeah, we can try that out. Um, I, I think. Yeah, the whole reasoning behind this was just to figure out how to design our model. Because if we were able to extract enough code test pairs, then we could have just had like an encoder decoder model that was trained specifically on the pairs. Mm -hmm. But we realized that we didn't have sufficient data for that. So now we're training more of an autoregressive model that looks at both tests and code files individually as well as the pairs. And we hope that. It can do general code generation, but with the added advantage of having seen these code test pairs. Uh, and the whole star thing, and this was just to figure out if we should continue mining more or if we should if we're done and we should stop. Um, I don't know what's next. Stop. All right, hi everyone. I'll be talking about more breaking changes. So thank you, Daniel, for setting me up. Um, so I'm gonna use this figure as like a running example throughout the presentation. Uh, but basically, so sort of the background is that a lot of modern software, especially in open source, depends on uh, reuse of third-party library libraries, which you know we call dependencies. So here's a dependency tree where we have this document app in the square. And then it has a dependency on um, lib HTTP, which is an HTTP library, a PDF library. Those themselves have their own dependencies. And then there are version numbers in the mix. And then you have this other cloud of you know, other dependencies. So this graph can get kind of complicated, but um, it's an important part of the software that we use today. And just as a note, uh, all these libraries and applications may have some associated tests, which I've listed below. Now, uh, one thing is that breaking changes are a problem for application developers. So if we consider a doc app and it depends on these two libraries, HTTP and PDF, uh, one example may be that uh, the doc app developer wants to upgrade their version of HTTP to 3.2. Uh, but now, since they are introducing new changes from this third party library, which they're not responsible for, how are they confident that this will not break their own application? Another, um, uh, another side of this coin is there are a problem for library developers. So libhttp now wants to release 3.0 publicly. How are they confident that they will not break downstream clients, causing them to be upset and you know having them to go back and refactor, uh, fix their code, et cetera. Uh, and library developers are often pressured to 
uh, pump out these releases to, to give new features to their clients. So they're sort of trading off this risk of introducing breaking changes, but also trying to introduce new features. And so one common term you may have heard in or software developers is dependency hell, which is they're trying to manage whether they upgrade a, a library dependency, whether that will break their application and they're stuck in some really annoying spot. So another type of question is why should doc app even upgrade its dependencies? Let's say they have a working version of HTTP, why don't they just leave it? And uh, if they don't need new features, it's fine, this, this thing works. Well, uh, one sort of famous example that happened in March is the Equifax data breach. And uh, the reason behind this was it was dependent on a third party library called Apache Struts. Um, and they, this library released this uh, patch in I think March 7th that basically thwarts this vulnerability. Uh, but Equifax did not update their uh, dependency for a few days. And then this whole data breach hacking started. And um, so the, the sort of moral of the story is you wanna keep your dependencies up to date since you need these security patches that may be extremely important like in this case. So then the application developers now also need to upgrade their dependencies. Um, and one strategy for preventing breaking changes or in general, these bugs that get introduced is regression testing. So if I am a library developer, say libhttp, I write a test suite for my library that is run anytime I'd like to release a new version. Um, and hopefully if I caused a breaking change, these tests should cache it. Um, and so if I want to run 3.2, uh, if I want to release 3.2, I'll run test H1 and H2. But the issue is they might, may not be comprehensive enough since I, as a library developer, may not be able to anticipate all the different use cases that my downstream clients depend on me for. So I don't know how exactly DocApp is going to use libhttp. I just kind of have to guess what the edge cases are. And so they may not be comprehensive enough. Another strategy is there has been, this is a fairly popular field, breaking change research and detection tools. Um, however, they're mostly targeted towards API breaking changes. So uh, if libhttp changes a method signature or a, a class signature, uh, in that case, you can sometimes detect it statically without even having to run your tests or run your application. Uh, you can run a tool that statically goes over your code and um, decides whether there is some breaking change and flags it immediately. But this will not detect like a behavioral change, which Daniel mentioned, which uh, changes the actual behavior of a function or something that may impact what happens downstream. So our approach is to sort of strengthen our regression testing suite by leveraging the test suites of the downstream clients. Um, and so as an example, if I want, if libcompress wants to release a new version, it looks at its downstream clients, in this case, libhttp and libpdf, and runs those tests against the new version that they'd like to release. And if we don't break their tests, in, or if their tests pass essentially compared to how they were performing before, then we're a little more confident that we can release our new versions because it's not breaking the tests that are exercising our library. And so, um, on the contrast, so that was from a library developer perspective, as an application developer, if I want to upgrade a dependency, I can basically say, well, this library broke a different client's test, so maybe I should be cautious about upgrading. So going into our implementation idea uh, design decisions, our first challenge is how do we actually get the clients of a given library if we want to execute their test suites? Um, and I'm looking specifically at the Maven ecosystem, which is Java applications. So I would say there's sort of a top-down approach, which is let's you know clone a bunch of repositories and parse through them to get all the dependencies of each other and get this dependency network. Um, and then there's another sort of approach, which is bottom up, where is let's start with our library and a maybe new version of that library and sort of query the Maven ecosystem, which might have this data to get the uh, downstream clients. And so, we, we ended up choosing bottom up since we're sort of thinking from the perspective of a library developer and if we wanted to make a tool that would help them. Um, the second challenge is how do we actually automatically execute the downstream client test? And this is like the biggest challenge, right? Um, so one sort of decision is you could get the source code and this kind of goes hand in hand with the top down where you clone all these repositories, you have to build the source code um, and then you can run the test. So building the source code and running the test automatically is fairly non-trivial since uh, it depends on a lot of uh, versions and things like that. Um, and also it's non-trivial to go from a given downstream client to the source code automatically since these things may not be publicly available. Uh, what we decided is another approach that is sort of Maven specific, uh, which is Maven has the central repository 
that contains uh, jars of, of projects that have updated to the central Maven repository. And uh, they also contain these things called test jars, which are basically pre-compiled versions of their test classes. So we can automatically fetch the test jars without having to go through the, like you know GitHub, cloning the repository, building it, running it. And we can simply download the test jars of clients and run them through Maven directly. And I'm, I'm making this sound very simple just as a strength of our design decision, but in reality, uh, this was a very large challenge to, to automatically execute these tests since we also wanted to instrument these tests with things like code coverage and things like that. And I will say it got a little hacky at times and is still sort of an iterative process. And so our progress um, for evaluation, we want to validate the approach by taking a bug data set and essentially running our tool to catch these bugs to see if the bugs would have been caught. And the progress is going. Um, I've like tested it on a library for 10 existing bugs so far, but due to some Maven environment specific issues, I'm not entirely confident that the results can be trusted yet. And I'm still iterating on this automatically executing the test suite, getting coverage process. And then finally uh, on tool building, I'm sort of writing like an automatic thing to generate a, a GitHub action to essentially run our, our prototype. Um, and uh, right now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on it and it seems promising that it can be done. Um, and finally, some next steps, I'll run through this in amount of time, but we need to finish the evaluation, run a larger scale evaluation across the entire Maven ecosystem to find new bugs. Um, and then uh, this is down the line, but eventually if, if this, you know, seems much more promising, we can finish building the tool and, and run a user study. And I, I've thought a bit more about that, that I'll include the report. And as a final note, I haven't thought of a good name for this project. So if anyone has a cool <laughs> idea, please let me know. Matt and Sam. Yeah. Or tell me, tell me your names. Cool ideas. Yes. Um, since a lot of them are taken, like Dependabot is pretty nice, but um, yeah. There's another tool called like Guard Dog and things like that. I don't know. There's some like sort of layer of defense slash watcher. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah, um, that is my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I think we got time for lunch. This is a somewhat silly question, but do you ever anticipate writing a Sigmovic paper where you import your tool and have to find the most minimum changes that break the most uh, test cases and cause the most uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> scale? Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> I think maximizing that would be an interesting challenge. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why my brain went there. So. Yeah. I, I do like these like simple inversions that that are hard problems yeah. and very important results. <laughs> All right. Well, let's give a uh, boss. Oh my God. Sorry. I <laughs> thought we wanted to do another round of applause. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, next person. Okay, everyone, well, today I'm going to talk about my final um, presentation of my project, Capability for Data Engineering. Um, so, the background story of this project is that, um, as many of us might have known, machine learning models are usually developed under these idealized settings where we assume that we have a static data set that uh, we also assume, might assume that the data set is ID, but this might not be true in many practical settings. And these models are often suffered in the wild. So for example, if you are developing a pedestrian detection model using some public data sets, and these models might not be able to recognize wheelchair users simply because the data set don't have them. And they might not be robust to extreme weather or have to or barely detect pedestrians of different ages. So to mitigate these issues, capabilities have been proposed to do that. So capabilities are essentially partial specifications of machine learning model behaviors. So for example, we could specify how uh, the pedestrian detection model should behave with regard to distribution shift or different robustness or fairness. Um, that's true. But even though we have uh, some initial work on that, it's still unclear how these capabilities could help machine learning model development and especially how we could identify these capabilities on the first uh, on the first part. Yeah. So to um, 
And to understand that problem better, we first conduct an experiment or a quantitative study to explore whether capabilities are reflective of model generalizability. And we focus on model generalization first because uh, it, it's a primary goal for any machine models and for implementing our tasks. So what, uh, our goal here is that we want to observe the correlations between model accuracies on the source domains or the domain or the data, data that is trained on and the data that it has never seen before. We want to see whether the actual information like, like accuracy on capability test sets will help better predict model accuracies on OD data essentially. So our instantiation here is that we use a parameter model data set. So these data sets have many different categories. We use one category as our training data and all the other other nine categories as our test data, we will train a series of model on the one category and try to test it on the categories that you haven't seen before. And um, to develop a series of capability for a simple analysis in particular, we use existing, existing uh, taxonomy on that. So we derive a capabilities that engage in shift to your modality. And mostly we are using keywords trying to find uh, corresponding sentences in the data set. And uh, to, observe, to observe the correlation between um, in domain accuracy and auto domain accuracy, we essentially fit a linear model to do that. And we look at adjusted R squared to see whether the model might have a better fit with extra variables, say like um, accuracies on capability tests. So our results show that first capabilities indeed better help predict model generalization compared to other baselines. Um, we think that in one and a half cases, it significantly help improve uh, prediction of OD accuracy compared to baselines like just using a random subset accuracy or random noise to original accuracy. We also find that this trend, uh, the predict power improvement kind of correlates with distribution and distance. So this indicates that if the target distribution is further away from the source domain, uh, the capability test accuracy could actually help the prediction better. Probably because uh, if they are further away, the original accuracy doesn't help that much in prediction. But uh, besides the positive signals, we also have some, uh, we also have some, some issues in the experiment. So we are make, um, mostly two problems. One is that we found different capabilities at different amount of information. So some capabilities are more informative than others because um, some capabilities like negation, like I actually cover half of the data set. So the distribution then, themselves is not that different from the original one, while some other uh, categories like shifter, they are more distinct from the original data set. So that's an issue. And the other is that we found different capabilities at different kinds of information. So some categories are complementary to each other. So for example, if we use shifter and modality together, they will help each other. And if we, but some others like overlap with each other. So this indicates how we need to better understand how to build a text, both a taxonomy of capabilities and use that to inform our tool design to support how to identify better capabilities essentially for, for example, in this case, support generalization. So our next step would be a user study where we will ask users to conduct, uh, to perform open-ended tasks of finding capabilities from some provided models and data sets. In that process, we will test different existing tools and interaction designs, like example based on our anchors or whether we have access to model explanations or not. Um, for the study, we will have a one-hour session with Pinkal protocol, and we do, do screen and audio recordings and analyze all the all that data, and we will try to identify common patterns and trade-offs between these different methods and try to um, find something about how to better identify capabilities using existing methods or new met method designs. Yeah. Um, that's all for my talk. Thank you. So how exactly are capabilities defined? Is it like uh, they have certain metrics on, uh, mm -hmm. I guess in this case, like the sentiments 
uh, on, on the performance. And then the capability test suite is just, uh, and then it's measured across the capability test suite? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there are many different ways to define it so, or to instantiate it. So here we uh, kind of, for example, we have uh, this negation capability, essentially two keywords, like not or every way a form of it. Mm -hmm. And we will find sentences based on these keywords, but you have different ways to do that. You could, uh, yeah, like perturb inputs or to just do call sourcing to generate these test inputs. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Okay. Well, you have to check it out. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's me. I know. I guess I'll I'll time myself. Make sure. <laughs> Breathing. I can do it. I think I should be good. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um. All righty. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully the puck is working. Um, so I guess my name is Jenny and I'll be talking about a project that I've been sort of working on, um, kind of investigating how usable are neural code generation tools. So to move into the background or motivation of this, um, as of the past couple of years, we've seen a shift towards using neural code generation tools in practice by software developers. Um, the recent research that's kind of come out of this, though, is that actually a lot of suggestions from these tools are, aren't actually um, accepted by developers. So one paper that came out recently said that only about 30 percent of suggestions in total were actually accepted by Copilot users. Yeah, but I haven't looked at that yet. Um, but other so some people have done some user studies as to why um, some challenges people might experience using these tools. And they come up with a few. So for instance, generated code might be hard to understand, debug, and potentially modified and to fit people's use cases. Um, developers also have difficulty trusting the output, as in that the code actually does what they want it to do. Um, other work suggests, actually from Bogdan, I've read from your paper, that some people might have some challenges in actually having background in specific frameworks, APIs, and things like that. Hey, uh, hey, room people, we can't hear you on Zoom. It's just totally gone. Thanks. Hello, hello. Yep, I can hear you now. Oh, you can hear. Hello, hello. Can you? No. Is there a way we can reduce the echo? Okay, is it good? Can everyone That's hear? Good. All righty, thank you. So I don't know if I can just, <laughs> I, I think it might be hard to summarize what I just said in the last. Let's all try. 
basically we're trying to look into the usability of cogeneration tools and try to quantify the space and usability because a lot of papers so far that are out in this um, field really have described some reason that people might face challenges in using them, but we really don't know um, the extent to which these reasons are actually um, the reasons why people have difficulty using cogeneration tools. So I have a list of research questions up there, um, but I think for time's sake, I might have to move on, unfortunately. But yeah. Okay. All right. So for this methodology, what I did was basically mined up 10,000 GitHub users um, from three language model code, sorry, code generation repositories. Um, two of them are actually from the official GitHub account, and one of them is from another um, code generation option called Tab9. And what I did was I basically mined up all the users that had forked, starred, or did something else for them. Oh, well. These repositories. Sorry. And in total, I have about 10,000 GitHub users that we could potentially send a survey to. Um, so, what I'll do is then send a survey, kind of trying to quantify these usability issues. And then from there, maybe based on the results, we might try to scope out some interesting findings and try to dig further into them using interview protocol. So, so far, what I've done was basically develop said survey that I just mentioned. Um, and then I piloted it on nine individuals, many of whom are in this class. So, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> to improve the clarity of these questions. Um, I actually kind of lied. I actually haven't submitted the IRB, but it's pretty much done. And I, I was optimistic um, that I'd be submitted by today. And then finally, I also mined the potential list of participants from GitHub repositories, which is where I got another 10,000. Um, and the whole with this sort of type of research project is that we can get high scale results and trying to quantify the uh, space of usability. So I'm hoping to completely like um, five, four, 400 at least responses to a survey like this. So for RQ1, um, by the way, all of these results are based on the nine data points I had, so they <laughs> may not scale very well. But in, to, in order to answer RQ1, to what extent do programmers rely on code draination tools, um, we see that people kind of respond to that they use it, you know, either on a daily or weekly basis. And the coloring is really hard to tell here. So I've actually added like the probably most relevant part that you care about. No one seems to really use Amazon Code Whisper, and people don't really seem to use Tab9, which is also another alternative. So it's mostly co-pilot users based on the sample. And they, yeah, like I said, tend to use it on a daily or sort of a yeah, actually, yeah, some of them use it, half of them use it on like a daily-ish basis. Is it free to use? Huh? Is it free to use? Yes, if you're a GitHub student, you can use it. Um, so, and, and also we asked what percent of coders were in using these tools and no one used the other tools, so I don't update all that, but the profile user said about 25, 20 ish percent of their code is written using, um, Copilot. Uh, co and notably, this number actually lines up really well with the study that I mentioned before in terms of how many percent of uh, su uh, suggestions are accepted. So it's actually interesting to see this line up even with such a small sample. Um, in terms of why programs choose to use the cogeneration tools, um, what we're sort of seeing so far is that people really just are trying to make their lives easier in terms of these typing lists, really. Um, they're, they're not really using it to actually discover potential ways to, do, to write a solution, which is what some pilot literature sort of suggested. Um, I skipped RQ3 because I only have one data point in that, so that's why there's no results for that. Um, but for RQ4, how, do, how well do programmers understand the code written by code generation tools? Um, most people really don't seem to have actually that much trouble um, actually reading the code. So understanding doesn't seem to be a huge, huge issue in terms of usability issue. Okay. And then um, in terms of like why people find uh, have trouble understanding code written by code generation tools, most of it is because either the code is too long to read too quickly or too long to read quickly. And also partially because some of the APIs included um, are things that the developers are familiar with. And um, finally, or actually second to last one, what, what do programmers do to get useful suggestions out from code generation tools? There's a, a wide variety of strategies that people kind of talked about using. Um, our sample is only nine, so I'm not very confident in this coding scheme at all. But I, I think it's definitely something to look more into in using an interview protocol, because it really seems like there's a really broad sort of um, breadth of strategies that people use. So I really wanted to dig into that more. Um, in terms of actually um, what people do when they um, 
get the code. A lot of people say that they actually don't use the code as is. The sections that I've highlighted here are what people end up doing with the code, which is like doing small modifications and things like that, which seems to happen more than at least half the time. And I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain all this because I'm really running low. Um, and then finally, why do programmers give up using tools? Um, a lot of it is because um, the code doesn't do what the developer wants it to do. And it really doesn't seem like usability or understanding the code itself actually tends to be that big of an issue. Um, so yeah, those are just some findings. And then next step. So I'm hoping to release this for a survey in early January, hoping to get at least 400 responses. We might get 500 if we're lucky, but we'll see. And then um, after seeing the results, um, after we release it in January, I'm hoping to kind of see what the results look like and develop an interview protocol based on that to kind of dig into the reasons why we might see some interesting findings. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm sorry, I really went over time with the tech malfunction, but thank you. But you're the timekeeper, so there's no way to check you on it. That's true. <laughs> and actually, I think we have like a minute or something for questions. Um, since the other people have asked, so if anyone has questions, seems to be asked. Yeah. 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 The tool tends to suggest stuff like all the time. So, like, if you're accepting 20%, then that's equivalent to it writing something that's under code. Yeah, I think so. I guess, I guess maybe that might not be the most fair comparison. To, or what I said earlier might not be the most 100% uh, like one to one comparison. But I was sort of thinking, like, if people were using these suggestions more frequently, if they were getting a lot of these suggestions and they actually accepted all of them, then like there would be a chance that more code would be written by these tools. Um, although I think you're right, that's not the most correct construct, I think, to carry it. Yeah, good point. That was subtle. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Great. Not <laughs> All right, um, Sophia and Eden, you guys are next. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, not yet, because you're on the wrong speaker, but hopefully we'll fix that. Oh. Uh, did the battery die? Is that what happened? The plug is dead again. I don't have it currently. Is it on? Yeah, there's a button on the top. Yeah. If you pass it back, I'll. Smartphone connected. Let's try again. Uh, can you say something, Aiden, please? Yeah. Uh, hello. Nice. It works. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we are. Okay. So this is um, on uh, an ex uh, experiment on best papers in computer science, and we're trying to figure out um, if they are different and more impactful or uh, and also sort of how these papers are chosen from the committee. Um, and this is with Sophia and me. Do we have control? You can request it somehow. You I got a options. request remote control. It's like nearly up. Oh. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I did that. OK. So you should be able to click, I think, or use the arrow keys. Nice. That's okay, all you. Cool. Um, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, Sophia can do this okay. one. So this is pretty much the same slide as last time. Um, just a highlight of the somewhat vague description of the ACM distinguished paper, best paper um, award category. And um, what we pointed out originally when we proposed this study was just that 
certain aspects of the paper that are mentioned in this description and that I gather we sort of collectively associate with a best paper are unknowable at the time of review. And so this sort of raises the question, um, A, right, how do people actually, you know, detect this if they're reviewing a paper and they're told, you know, give this award to the ones that will be most impactful. Um, how do they actually try and, you know, uh, predict that based on what they have in front of them or do they try at all? Um, and then also, do, uh, you know, how good are they at doing that, right? Because this is inherently a prediction. So if they're trying to use some qualities to um, assume how impactful a paper will be that are evident in it at the time that it's submitted, then, you know, how good are those signals that they're using at really um, correlating with uh, something that leads to impact? So that was sort of the, uh, Aiden, can you go to the next slide? Yep. Okay. Um, so that was sort of the initial thought process. Um, and I think as we started doing interviews and just talked more about this and thought more about it, um, we sort of hammered down a little more what we were trying to actually study. So, um, just in terms of background and lit review, there's all these papers about how um, there's scientific overload because the number of papers published in pretty much every scientific field, but computer science included, continues to grow each year. Um, there's also, I, I think Mary Shaw has talked about this before, but there's countless papers talking about the over-optimization of publication metrics, how people try and uh, publish more papers rather than publishing, you know, high quality papers. Um, and given all of these factors, uh, right, we also observe that citations might serve as signals that tell a reader, you know, hey, I'm gonna, this paper really matters because, whoa, it's the most cited paper in my field. I guess, I guess I have to look at it. And so that might be how you decide which paper to read if you're looking through, um, you know, a bunch of older papers, right? But you don't have time to read all of the new papers that come out, just unless you're a super fast reader or uh, don't do anything else except to read papers. So um, the idea was like, okay, you need some kind of way of, you know, lessening your, your stack of papers to read. So maybe you'd use citations normally, but if, you know, the conference is happening now and there's no data on citations, at least not in software engineering venues, um, and so uh, we were thinking, OK, well, there is this distinguished paper category. And so maybe this serves as a signal that tells people, hey, this is the special one in all of the noise that I'm going to pay attention to. Um, but at the same time, right, we there aren't really many papers on how the distinguished paper label impacts uh, the future of a paper down the line, other than that one that was, did this very narrow statistical analysis and no no real qualitative analysis from a few years back. Um, and we were even like completely unsure. And we realized as we were interviewing people too, like how confused we were about how the papers were actually chosen. Um, so, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm talking too much. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, move on, Sophia. Okay, okay. Yeah, so Aiden. Um, yeah, so for the methodology, originally we have these three RQs. Um, the one is, uh, how do committees um, choose which best paper, which papers should deserve best paper awards? RQ2 is what features are most common amongst these best papers. And three is, do these papers have more impact than other accepted papers, um, both in the short and long term? Um, and RQ1 is really more of a qualitative analysis. Um, and all three put together is what makes it a mixed study where RQ1, we interview members of best paper award committees and try to figure out what that committee means and um, what they do together to make these decisions. And then the methodology for RQ2 and 3 is we collect data from all of the best papers since 1996 across 10 top computer science conferences. And then we want to do statistical analysis on all of the citation counts and also measure if there is any relationship between the 10-year impact awards um, and the best paper awards at publication date. 
Um, and just because at the beginning of the first talk that we gave, there were a lot of questions raised on related work. So we did do a deep dive on that to find out if our work is different and what we're doing is unique. So there are papers that have worked on readability of award winning. Okay, we don't have time to go through this. Yeah. But just trust that we, our thing is, yeah, not, uh, I guess it's not different. Too, it's real different. <laughs> yeah. So the progress so far is that we have collected citation data by year from all of the best papers. Uh, we completed interview with researchers that have nominated and also chosen best paper awards as uh, general PC. Uh, we've obtained results on how conference general chairs do select these best papers and the insights on how people even read best paper awards, uh, the papers that have won distinguished paper awards. Uh, but there have been some difficulties in data collection. And based on availability of survey participants, which is actually better than the data that we have, we revamped RQ1 and 2. Um, and so the original RQ2 is what features are most common um, uh, among best papers. And we figured that would be very difficult to do because it's hard to define like what are features. Um, and it's also very difficult to have that um, like prediction on those. Um, and so for now, our first RQ is now, um, how are these conference best paper selection committee structured? Um, so like what that entails. And then RQ2 is our previous RQ1 is how do these committees decide which papers are awarded best paper. And just a uh, high level progress is um, we we found out that often there are no dedicated best paper award selection committees, uh, but often uh, just conference general chairs choose based on the insight of reviewer nominations. Um, and they usually do that based on highest review scores. Um, and they acknowledge that they um, don't accurately select for impact at time of public, uh, at time of the selection for best paper. And well-written papers, um, so papers that have proper grammar and clean with beautiful graphs tend to matter much more than the novelty and um, like the impact at time for best paper awards. And they also mentioned that best papers tend to receive uh, larger conference talk turnout rates. And uh, we want to, after that, use the data that we have to see if that turnout rate will have any correlation with the citation count. And so the next step is to complete all of the statistical analysis to answer RQ3 um, and to analyze all of the results and write a coherent story out of all of this. And that's it for us. Comments? We, we don't have time for comments. Uh, no, we have like a minute-ish. Oh. Well, I guess one thing is I, it makes me, or like seeing the results and like now considering all the times and retypos of the drafts that I submitted. <laughs> I, I always told people that you should not neglect writing quality and presentation quality in your papers. Because uh, no matter how good the work is, you won't have as much impact if it's written poorly. Sure. Yeah, the one, one sort of substantive feedback. There's some confusion when you're presenting this between best paper awards at time of publication and impact awards, which usually happen 10 years later. Uh, so you know, something to keep in mind as you're writing this up, um, I think, uh, you know, which which things are you actually referring to? It seems like when you talk about best paper awards, you're referring to both kinds, at, at least as far as I understood the presentation. Oh, um, yeah, no, sorry. Um, when we say best paper, it's just the, the best, like the distinguished paper award. Um, and when we say um, like the impactful, then we say the 10 year impact award. Um, right. So okay. yeah, we will make sure to, to make that clear. Thank you. I think that's the most interesting part is the correlation between awards at time of publication and impact say 10 years later. That's the part that I, I think is most interesting. Yeah, I agree. We we asked mm -hmm. some of the interviews about that and noticed that there was a specific committee always for the, at least in terms of the conferences the people we'd interviewed had been PCs for. Like they always had a committee for test of time that really went through the papers in depth, but for distinguished papers for a given year, it was, seemingly like a short list of high scoring reviews and then you know kind of just a, a, a look at the reviews that other people had given it but not like a, a deep dive into 
each paper. So there's definitely a difference in how they described going through the two types that we are going to highlight in the paper. Yep. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. We're technically over, right? Thank you. But so if people have commitments, I won't hold it against you if you decide to leave. But if you, we have one left. No, yes. we're not. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> So if you don't have commitments, you know, I would appreciate it. I'm sure so would Luke, um, you know, if we hear his presentation too. Sorry about the time management. I'm so sorry. I miscounted. No, totally. I'm so sorry. But I, I'm here. So uh, feel free to go away if you have something else to do. Uh, but this is the last one, I think. Yes. I, when I was working on that later today, there was definitely no slides after mine. So we are the last one. Sounds good. Unless somebody snuck something like the last time. <laughs> <laughs> right in the back out. There. Um, do you quicker in the right All right, got a clicker, got a puck. Cool. Okay. Um, so just the big one in the middle for cool. Yeah. This will be weird. I'm used to pressing my keyboard. Um, okay, so uh, I will get started so you can all you all can leave eventually. Um uh, my talk uh, is on um, decompilation. Uh, so um, decompilation is the process performed by a decompiler, um, which, uh, as uh, the name uh, suggests, um, performs the inverse operation to a compiler. So a compiler takes source code and converts it into an executable program, uh, and a decompiler does the opposite. It goes from an executable, executable program and converts it into source code. Um, unfortunately, um, it can't do a very good job of this because the compiler discards a lot of the um, abstractions uh, that um, are present in source code to make it easier to read for humans because they're not actually necessary for um, uh, executable programs. But what this means is that decompiled code is, is very difficult to read. Um, in, in particular, it's, it's very non-idiomatic. So I have um, a, a little excerpt here where um, the on the right uh, is some uh, just a normal uh, struct reference um, in C, uh, and the left is how it's decompiled. So obviously that's a lot harder to figure out what's going on um, in this little code fragment. So um, before the semester started, we developed a tool for correcting these um, structural and stylistic issues, just basically based on the language model. Um, but we need to know how well it performs. Um, and uh, this is a bit of an interesting problem, especially because um, there's no existing work that shows how decompiled code differs from um, the uh, original source code uh, is the term I've been using for that. So um, we know it is different. We know it's very ugly, but like in what specific ways is it ugly? Um, so uh, we performed a qualitative study to do that. Um, but the quantitative portion um, is actually just evaluating the tool. So how well um, does our tool actually correct for these structural and stylistic differences? Uh, and we also answered a third uh, research question um, about sort of to direct future work. So uh, what should future work um, do to help fix remaining issues, assuming our tool is not absolutely perfect? Um, if so, then we're done, but uh, I, I doubt that is, is the case. Um, so the methodology uh, sort of uh, follows this framework. So first we'll do the qualitative uh, study. Um, we're, we used uh, open coding techniques to do this. So this is exactly what you'd um, use on um, like uh, interview data or, or unstructured text data. Uh, but it was, so it was a little bit interesting applying this to um, decompiled code. Um, and then uh, the second step is to build a tool for aligning statements between two functions based on how um, uh, variables are used. So we can have um, see which statements match up to each other. Uh, and thus, this will allow us to do the quantitative study. Uh, measuring how well um, our other tool, the enhancement tool, um, fixes uh, the issues we identify in the um, So progress is qualitative, qualitative studies complete. Um, I won't go into more detail there. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's complete. So, um, the, uh, um, so this is uh, essentially the, the uh, uh, research, quant research question one answer. Uh, we have the comprehensive code book. There are 43 different codes, although they're organized hierarchically. Um, so there's um, 14 top level codes. Um, this is a 16 page document, so I will not walk you through it, but that is the, uh, that is the, the um, there is a, a systematic uh, text on that uh, we created. Uh, 
Um, research question three is what I'll spend a little bit more time talking about. So um, what methods um, are necessary to uh, address uh, the issues that we identified in part one? So I'm, I sort of viewed this along two different axes, axes. Um, uh, non-determinism. Um, so some things we can fix statically with just the, the information present in the, um, in the code. Uh, and then other things will require an increasing amount of non-determinism up to like some sort of general uh, length model. Um, the other thing is predictive information. So sometimes all the information like a reasonable developer would need um, to, to try to fix that um, defect is in the function itself. But sometimes um, the information you need to fix that defect is elsewhere in the program. Um, so there's sort of the scale of how much information you need to, to fix the defect as well. Uh, so in terms of methods, um, you plot this in, in two dimensions, it might look something like this. So you can have uh, the simplest thing is like some, some sort of function level static analysis, maybe not simple, but at least um, deterministic um, uh, and or sorry, most deterministic lowest information um, uh, would be just some sort of function level static analysis. Um, we would expect that there is very little of this because uh, decompilers already do um, some of this. Uh, then the opposite end of the spectrum um, just refers to like large language models. Um, so uh, these are fairly general. Um, they can actually fix all of these other things, but um, they are uh, less deterministic and they can make um, subtle mistakes, which is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, in particular, uh, large language models tend to struggle with bigger input. So if we're trying to do a program level thing, um, they, they might struggle a little bit. Uh, and here's as I said, there's 14 uh, top level codes. So they're sort of distributed throughout the space like this. Um, uh, the two main patterns uh, that are notable, there's that cluster in the middle. Um, and this uh, corresponds to, two minutes, okay. Um, this corresponds to um, defects that uh, are deterministic given a type. So if we can predict a type um, for a given variable, um, then, um, and they just plug that back into the decompiler. So tell the decompiler that, yes, this chunk of memory is this type and it behaves in a certain way. Um, then you can deterministically fix it from there um, to produce uh, output that makes sense. Um, and then the other category is the non-deterministic uh, stuff sort of clustered um, on the uh, right side uh, of the screen. So um, for research question three conclusions, um, a uh, good type prediction uh, can fix a significant quantity um, of defects uh, uh, if methods um, are uh, re-decompiled, so we basically reanalyzed uh, with that type information. Um, and then most of the other defects um, require some uh, significant non-determinism um, to, to uh, uh, attempt to fix these, uh, especially um, program level stuff, which might mean uh, there not, might need to be some innovation in the um, uh, amount of input you can have uh, into a language model. And we're working with somebody uh, on that. Uh, that is, I went a little bit faster. I tend to do that actually, uh, <laughs> a little bit faster than I expected. So uh, that's the, that's what I have for you today. Uh, any questions? Only thing surprising is that you didn't do this earlier. <laughs> yes. Question. Mm -hmm. What is the point of doing decompilation really well besides creating malware? Um, to do the opposite, um, analyze malware. Uh, so if people want to figure out um, what malware is doing, um, that's a thing that, that you, uh, it's used for. So it sort of helps both sides. It's also actually useful for and this is a thing people aren't as aware of, like patching legacy software. Um, so there's lots of like really old C and COBOL stuff out there that's important. Um, the original uh, develop, uh, company that made that software might not exist. So if we need to fix that old software, decompiler is kind of your option. Um, so that's the thing people aren't as aware of. It's another thing to accomplish. Very good. With that, thank you. Thank you for doing this with me.